to worship. Good morning. You're very lopsided this morning. Uh, we welcome the family here as you, we baptized Hattie this morning. Um, so if a few of you that are in the back want to move over and sit on this side, even it out. Uh, that's you, Glenn. Uh, that be... No, you don't have to move, but it's just kind of funny. <laughs> um, this is the first Sunday of Advent, and so we are um, excited and waiting for Christmas to come. And so there is a little bit of a liturgy of uh, readings for lighting the Advent wreath that require you to take different parts Claim what you want to be, what you are. If you're an older adult, you claim that. If you're a younger adult and you're 80 and you want to be a young adult, you can claim that. If you are a child of God, you can read the part for children. Um, you choose which part for lighting the Advent wreath. It is a fun liturgy for us to join together in. This is the new church year, and it begins with a wake-up call. Christ is coming soon. Isaiah proclaims the day when God will gather all the people on the holy mountain, and there will be no more war or suffering. Though we vigilantly watch for the promised day of salvation, we wait for what we already have. Christ comes among us this day as the word and meal that strengthens our faith in the promises of God. Uh, so please join me in our liturgy for lighting the Advent wreath. Acolyte. Yep. I didn't give directions before church. Let me get to that part. Okay, thank you. My bad. Nothing. All right. Just follow along in the bulletin. All right. Over 100 people from the ages of 2 to 80 years old were asked the question, what gives you hope? From the voices of different generations, we hear their answers. <laughs> Kindness from strangers. <laughs> Social progress. Babies trying over and over to take their first steps. The sunrise every single morning. What gives you hope? Today, we light the candle of hope. Abby. <laughs> we light the candle of hope to remind ourselves that God is at work in this world. From generation to generation, God has brought good news of love and compassion, justice and community. Let us rest and abide in that good news. Amen. Please stand as you are able for our confession and forgiveness. In God's house, everyone is welcome. There's those who seem like they have it all together and those who feel like the world is falling apart. No matter who we are, there's room for us here. With that confidence, we turn to God in prayer, speaking the truth of our lives. Let us pray. God of today, God of tomorrow, you say, bring your full self. There's room for you here. You say, bring your hopes and your dreams. There is room for you here. You say, bring your grief and your prayers. There is room for you here. God of today, God of tomorrow, we know in our hearts there is room for us here. Forgive us for withholding our Help us remember today and tomorrow. Every story. Amen. Family faith, we who feel scattered and are held together, we who have lost our way are forgiven and found. 
We who are lonely are brought into the fold and told, there's room for you here. From generation to generation, this is the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are held, forgiven, found, and welcomed. Thanks be to you, God. Let us sing together our gathering song in the Cranberry Red Hymnal 661.
Let us pray. God of the ages, in scripture we hear stories of people like us, ordinary people, people who long to know you, people who long to follow you, the people who make mistakes, the people who try to grow old, young, teenagers, immigrants, new to the faith, lifelong believers. In scripture, we hear stories of people like us. So just as you walk with them, help us to hear and remember all the things that you want of us. We are listening. We are grateful. We are yours. Amen. You may be seated for our scripture reading. First reading today is from Isaiah chapter 2, beginning with verse 1 through 5. The word that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains, and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob that he may teach us in his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thank you, Lord. We'll read Psalm 122 responsibly. I was glad when they said to me, Let us go to the house of the Lord. Now our feet are standing. Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built as a city, to which the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord. For there are the thrones of judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper and love you. Peace be with your walls, and quietness within your towers. For the sake of my kindred and companions, I pray for your prosperity. Because of the house of the Lord our God, I may speak to you. The second reading today comes from chapter 13 of Romans 11 through 14. Paul comes, compares the advent of Christ to the coming of dawn. We live in our lives today in light of Christ's coming in the future. Besides this, you know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone, the day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. From the word of the Lord. <laughs> Good job, Karen, and I'm not going to do as good job as you. 
that on an account of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah was the father of Perez and Zareph, and by Tamar, Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Aram, Aram the father of Amminadad, Amminadad the father of Nashon, Nashon and Nashon the father of Solomon. Salmon, the father of Boaz by Rahab, Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth, Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah, and Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, Rehoboam, the father of Abja, Abja, the father of Asaph, Asaph, the father of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat, the father of Joram. And Joram, the father of Uzziah, Uzziah, the father of Jotham, and Jotham, the father of Ahaz. Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah, the father of Massan. Massan, the father of Amos, and Amos, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jehoiah, and his brothers at the time of deportation to Babylon. After the deportation to Babylon, Jehoiah was the father of Sethahiel, sure. And Zephiel, the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel, the father of Adoi, Adoi, the father of Alkim, Alkim, the father of Azor, Azor, the father of Zadok, Zadok, the father of Akim, Akim, the father of Eloi, 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 the father of Eleazar, Eleazar, the father of Methan, Methan, the father of Jacob, Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, before Jesus, who is called the Messiah. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, and from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the de deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. The Gospel of our Lord. You can say that with confidence, but all right, you can be seated. If there is any children of God who wish to come forward for a children's message, come on, Derek. We'll make your sister sit with you if no one else comes up. All right. Actually, I need you guys to sit over there. Can you sit on that way? All right. Just sit down. Anywhere. Thank you. All right. So... Oh, we have a reader over here. You know what that, the title of this book is called? Yes. The Time of Christmas. You see any Christmas things that are up in church? Yeah. Derek, you know who put up the Christmas tree? Oh. All right, you know who put up the Christmas tree? Oh, Karen put up the Christmas tree. Uh, did she do a good job? All right, I want you to thank her. You were sitting next to her. You can thank her when you get back to your pew. All right, we have the time of Christmas coming up. But before Christmas is this thing called Advent. All right, so this book is about some mice in the church. Church mice. Do any of you like mice? Are any of you afraid of mice? I am totally afraid of mice. Benny at, out at Faith Church, Benny said he wasn't afraid of mice, so I told him he could kill all the mice for me. But these are good church mice. They're learning about the different things that are happening in church. So at this time of year, we have Advent. Advent is the time when God's people get ready to celebrate Jesus' birth. Advent is also about promises Long ago, God promised he would send his son, Jesus, to be the Savior. God's people hear the words of the promise when they listen to the Bible readings. The little mouse asked, Why is there a bush in church? It's the funniest bush I've ever seen. What's it doing here? It's not a bush. It's an advent wreath. It is up there so everyone can see it. The wreath is a circle with no beginning, no ending. It reminds God's people of his love that never stops. Can you find anything that looks like a circle that's up here? <coughs> the window. 
over here, our Advent wreath is over there. It doesn't have any greenery on it. If it had greenery, it might look like a bush. Do you see the four, four candles that make up the circle and one in the middle? What are the different colors of the candles? Oh my gosh, you guys know colors. I know you know them. They are blue, pink, and white. Thank you. I know you know your colors. All right. There is one candle for each Sunday of the four Sundays in Advent. A new candle is lit every Sunday. When they're all burning brightly, Jesus' birthday will be very near. The mice learn many things about their new home in the church. They also learn things as they listen to the people who came into church every Sunday. They heard about the angels' messages to Zechariah, Mary, and Joseph, and hummed along with the people sang songs. Early one morning, just about the time the fourth candle on the Advent wreath was lit, the mice awoke to find the church with lots of activity. People were everywhere decorating the church with garland, unwrapping ornaments, put on the Christmas tree, and people were busy putting together a nativity scene. What is happening, the mice wondered. I think we should stay here in the balcony to be safe and just watch everything that is happening. <coughs> See, they are setting up the church. We haven't quite finished putting all of our things up in church, but we'll get ready for it. And we still gotta put a Christmas tree up outside and we're gonna decorate the fellowship hall. Have you guys decorated for Christmas yet? No? Yes, no? <laughs> No, that's okay. Well, there's two thoughts. Some people say, yes, your Christmas decorations should be up. Other people who are grouchy, like my brother, who I'm saying this to the camera so that he's being scolded, say Christmas decorations shouldn't be up yet. But we are waiting and preparing for Christmas. So it's okay to put some Christmas decorations up. Pour more up as we light a new candle on the Advent wreath each week. And what happens when all the candles on the Advent wreath are lit? It's Christmas. It's Christmas. You got the point of the story. And then the, the mice in the book will learn about Christmas. So as you're putting up Christmas decorations, hanging things on the tree, you have to wait and wait until Christmas comes. Do you guys like waiting? No. Do you want it to be Christmas already? Yeah. Well, that's the important about part about waiting. It's just to be in the part of waiting. Being hopeful and excited and waiting for Jesus to come. All right, thank you all for coming up. I have a coloring picture to hand out to you. It has something with the Advent wreath on it. All right. You know who really likes coloring pictures? Your mom, and you can put it on your clear fridge, and you can go back to your seats, or you can color them for your grandparents. And you may color this to for your church if you so choose. Reading the family tree. 
Well, I don't know everyone else's family tree. I'm trying to figure out some of yours and how they're related to every single person. As, yes, I know you are saying, raising your hand, because you know what happens every single Wednesday that we have the third through sixth graders, they have a competition. Who's their favorite cousin? And almost all of them are related. And if anyone comes into church, they will identify if they are related to that person or not. It's a thing with them. But there's some hard names in people's family tree. The Ollies and Stens are pretty easy. But when you get to three or four syllables and you don't know your ancestor's native language, those names get a little yeah. bit harder. Yeah. Or the names of young children that have too many consonants, too many of vowels, they replace vowels with extra I's in them, and it's just like, wait, how do you pronounce that? That is one of the most terrifying, terrifying parts, for at least for me, of reading someone's obituary is trying to pronounce all those names correctly. Or there are some of the people who always went by a middle name or a nickname instead of their actual name. <coughs> Linda, I don't remember Junior's actual name. It's just how you call him that. Because he was a junior. <laughs> there are those people. And above all, the Polish names are really scary. Maybe you grew up with lots of Polish names, but the Polish names, I think, are very scary. <clears throat> Many of us have our, have our names tied to the generations who have come before us. Those who are named after, di after different people, like little Hattie, named after a wonderful grandmother. Or her cousin Parker is also named after a wonderful person. And I know there's more people in your family tree that are named after other people. It's a great story to tell. Our names tie us to those before us, but also it's who comes after us. In Christ's genealogy, it reveals her relationships across time and space in his life. Each name is a mark of hope finally realized. Hope leading to the promised Messiah as God foretold in the beginning. Matthew's gene genealogy has 42 names. 14 from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the Babylonian exile, and 14 from the exile to Jesus. In that long list of names, we remember the trauma and triumph of those who came before us. And each name holds a story. When you look closely at each person, you may not be able to tell to see how each character propels the story forward. But stepping, stepping back and looking at the big picture, you can see how each story is woven together into a larger tapestry. This God story from the beginning through Christ has room for every person to tell their story. Abraham or Abram, when he first listened to God, hearing the promises of a great nation, leaving his home to follow God. Although he didn't actually trust God that he would father a nation with Sarah, so he tried to do it with his slave, Hagar. Abraham's grandson, Jacob, stole his brother's blessing by dressing up as him, but he was also renamed by God to Israel. Or King David, chosen and anointed by God, who slayed Goliath with a stone, but also killed Uriah and his company of soldiers to cover up that he conceived a baby with through wayward ways with the wife of Uriah, Bathsheba. The lineage of Jesus is never identified as sinners, but their actions do speak rather loudly. Rahab, Ruth, and Solomon, whom God gave wisdom and riches without compare, rise above the pack. Yet while Rahab made the Faith Hall of Fame in Hebrews chapter 11, she's named a prostitute. And Ruth seduced Boaz to secure her future. Solomon had over 700 wives and 300 concubines who turned him to follow and worship other gods.
Hezekiah began his reign at the right old, old age of 25, ruled for 29 years. He did what was right and just as his ancestor David had done. And his son bested him by taking the throne at 12, reigned for 55 years, and did what was evil in sight of the Lord. So much so that he did more evil than the nations whom the Lord had destroyed before the people of Israel. You want that story, that's Second Chronicles, as you go through everything. So Rubble, one of my favorite names that I actually can say in this lineage, embodied the sign of God's fidelity to Judah, but showed himself as xenophobic when the opportunity arose to reconcile with enemies and rebuilding the house of God, and possibly engaging in what would be described as interreligious dialogue today. For every Asaph who has beautiful verses from the Psalms attributed to him, like whom have I, whom have I heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire other than you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but my God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Or for every Josiah with no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his might, according to the law of Moses, nor did he like, like him arise after him. There are many more imperfect and seemingly immoral family members for of Jesus. Our families may indeed include a few folks with textured or colorful lives, such as the biblical characters. And as far as I know, no one hears family trees include people quite as extreme as the biblical characters. But their stories are still included in God's story. God works through the unexpected people and stories of the past and present. And our stories don't have to be as colorful as these people of the Bible. Today, names are the seed of hope one generation planted in another. That they are the thread that connects our histories, our stories, and futures. We are the hopes of those who have come before, and we live for those who will come after us. As we pass on our stories, how are we sharing God's story? God says there's room for every story to be included. But the one universal thread that weaves stories together is God's story of our hope in salvation through Jesus Christ's birth, sacrifice, resurrection, and second coming. We pass down names and stories, genes, good and bad ones, and the good and bad characteristics and habits. How are we, though, passing down God's story? As we pass down different things to the next generation, whether that be our children, grandchildren, or the great-grandchildren, we hopefully are also passing down what God's story means to us. Passing down God's story so God's story will continue. Even when we fail, God's story will continue. But we have to keep asking, how are we passing God's story down? Because we are in it. Every story matters. Amen. Our hymn of the day is hymn number 732 in the Cranberry Red book. And I believe this one has a reminder attached to it in that. Yes, reminder when singing this hymn of the day. Verse 4 is the last two lines. You don't sing verse 4 after the first or second verse. 4 comes after 3. I repeat this because someone does it every single time. Re sing verse 4 after verse 3. It's the last two lines. All right.
invite the baptismal family to come forward and the sponsors. Everyone else, I'll make sure you bring up your the bulletin insert. You need that. Everyone else, turn to the insert in your bulletin to follow along with it. Elsie, I brought a stool up so I know you can be involved into it. Can you? Yeah. Or you can sit down. I know you are a very active, engaged big sister. All right. When we baptize her, you got to pay attention. All right. And baptism, our graciously heavenly Father, frees us from sin and death. By joining us to the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, we are born children. We are born children of a fallen humanity, and by water and the Holy Spirit, we are reborn children of God and made members of the Church, the body of Christ, living with Christ in the communion of the saints. We grow in faith, love, and obedience to the will of God. Sponsors, we present Patty for baptism, called by the Holy Spirit, trusting in the grace and love of God. Do you desire to have Hattie baptized into Christ? We do. As you bring Hattie to receive the gift of baptism, you are entrusted with responsibilities to live with them among God's faithful people, to bring her to the Word of God and the Holy Supper, teach her the, teach her the Lord's Prayer, the Creed, and the Ten Commandments, place in her hands the Holy Scriptures, and nurture her in the faith and prayer, so that Hattie may learn to trust God and proclaim Christ through the Word and deed, and care for others and the world God made and work for justice and peace. Do you promise to help her grow in the Christian faith and life? I do. Sponsors, do you promise to nurture her in the Christian faith as you are empowered by God's Spirit to help her live in the covenant of baptism and in the communion with the church? I do. People of God, do you promise to support Hattie and pray for her in her new life in Christ? We do. I ask you to profess your faith in Christ Jesus, reject sin, and confess the faith of the church. Do you renounce the devil and all the forces that defy God? With conviction, I renounce. Next one we'll do with a little more conviction. Do you renounce the powers of this world that rebel against God? I renounce. Do you renounce the way of, ways of sin that draw you from God? I Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate. Right over the bowl, and we're going to baptize her. Okay, Patty, I bet. 
baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We give you thanks, O oh God, through the water and the Holy Spirit, that you give your daughters and sons new birth and cleanse them from sin, raise them to eternal life. Sustain Hattie with the gift of your Holy Spirit and the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, the spirit of joy in your presence, both now and forever. Amen. All right, so we're going to mark the sign of a cross on your forehead. Patty, Sharon, Nelson, child of God, you've been sealed by the power, sealed by the Holy Spirit, and marked with the cross of Christ forever. Amen. All right. Oh. Light your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. I'm gonna give this to you. Let us welcome the newly baptized. We will welcome you into the body of Christ and into the mission we share. Let us join together in giving thanks and praise to God and bearing God's creative and redeeming word to the world. You can clap and rejoice, hoot and holler as you choose.
uh, announcements that are happening. There is a whole host of things that are happening. You can read announcements in your bulletin. Uh, things to highlight. The noisy offering uh, that we collected, 339.93. And and the foundation is going to match that. So we will be buying goats through ELCA good gifts. It was a lot of coins and was re really heavy. So thanks for all who helped us collect for the noisy offering. Christmas parties that are coming up uh, next Sunday. There is. All right, let's start with the first. All right, going in order of Christmas <coughs> parties. The first Christmas party to hit up is December 4th, 2 p.m. at United Free Lutheran Church. Then you pop back over here at 5 o'clock for our Christmas party. From there, Wednesday, you go to Faith Church. Their Christmas party open to anyone. Um, it's not just the women. And then from after that one, Next Sunday, the 11th, there are some more Christmas parties, including Bethlehem's, right? Yes. I'm looking in this direction like you will tell me, yes. <laughs> Bethlehem's. I think Strathcona's is coming up too. Find out a Christmas party. Attend all the Christmas parties that you want to attend. Uh, you can look at your uh, bulletin for other announcements. Ones that are not in the bulletin. Uh, men are needed next Sunday at 4.30 to help serve and clean up for the Bethel ladies at the Christmas party. Uh, see uh, some of the particular men in charge over here. And uh, I have a special request for people who have a tad bit of muscle to help move some of those boxes that are blocking the... Uh, coat rack out there so we can just put them down in the Sunday yeah. school week. You did it already? Oh my gosh, I was going to make your child do it. <laughs> All right, well there is still Christmas decorations to put up. If you would like to help put up Christmas decorations, please see me and hopefully um, no one wants to set a time to put them up, but we need some help putting them up and um, putting together some of those. So are there any other announcements I perhaps missed? Uh, it's been a crazy morning for me with all the fog and I had a cow this morning, so I hope I didn't miss anything. Um, I'm not seeing anyone shout at me any other announcements. No one? Okay. With that, let us stand, sing our offertory hymn and receive our offering. It is indeed right in our duty and our joy that we should at all times and all places 
Give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. Surely from now on, all generations will call him blessed, for the mighty one has done great things for us, and is holy and is holy in his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your, whole, your name and join in their unending hymn.
we lift up this prayer. May the body and blood of our risen Lord and Savior keep you and give you strength. Faithful God, in this meal, you have remembered your mercy. Bring us he heaven to earth in the body and blood of Christ as we wait for the day when all our promises will be fulfilled. Sustain us and strengthen us by this holy mystery. God is toward the promised future, coming to birth in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please stand as you are able. Hear, receive, and believe this blessing. As you leave this place, may you go knowing from generation to generation we have been claimed and loved. From generation to generation, God has been on our side. And from generation to generation, we are not alone. The God of yesterday and the God of tomorrow knows you by name, loves you, and calls you for saying, Go be the person you are called to be. Love wildly, do justice, and come back soon. Amen. Let us sing together our sending him a good Advent tune, 239. Christ is near. Thank you. Oh, you did it so loudly. <laughs> um, I know the baptismal family will be probably taking pictures right away. So you may dismiss yourselves knowing that the pew in front of you might not be leaving. So back row, you're a go. Yeah. 